We're going to start with All the World is a Stage, Raising the Curtain on International Animal Law Advancements. And we're so pleased that we still have so many people here with us. So I would like to start with the introductions. I'm going to start with uh, Professor Raj Reddy. He teaches at the Center for Animal Law Studies at Lewis and Clark Law School, where he also directs the first advanced legal degree in animal law. The Animal Law LLM program is designed for US and international law graduates who desire to focus on animal law. Since its inception in 2012, the LLM program has educated more than 30 students from over a dozen countries. A graduate of Lewis and Clark, Raj served as the co-editor-in-chief of the Animal Law Review and co-director of the Lewis and Clark Animal Legal Defense Fund chapter while he earned his PhD in English. Outside of Lewis and Clark, he chairs the Animal Law section of the Oregon State Bar and the International Animal Law Subcommittee of the ABA. He also sits on the boards of the Humane Voters Oregon, Minding Animals International, and the Diversity, Equity, Inclusion nonprofit, Encompass. His casebook on international animal law and policy is forthcoming. <coughs> Next, we have Amy Wilson. Amy is the Aquatic Animal Initiative Fellow at the Center for Animal Law Studies, where she focuses on regulation and legal protection for aquatic animals and assists with the Animal Law Clinic. Additionally, Amy is the first South African attorney to graduate with a master's degree in animal law from Lewis and Clark's Animal Law LLM program. Outside of Lewis and Clark, she is co-founder and director of Animal Law Reform South Africa, a trustee of Humane Education Trust, and director and co-founder of Lawyers for Animal Protection in Africa. Amy has been published in international and US publications, and she has presented on several animal law topics all around the globe. And with that, we'll get our panel started. Good afternoon, everyone. Today, Raj and I are very excited to be talking to you about international and foreign animal legal developments happening all around the world. As is apparent from the presentations that we've already seen today, slowly but surely, we are seeing animals being transformed from mere props to players within our global stage. So today, please join us. We've got a theatrical theme on our three-act play for advocating for animals. And by raising the curtain today, we also hope to raise some questions. These developments are not always so clear cut and they require debate. And while we should celebrate our victories, we also need to be critical about what these mean in practice and what the implications are for animals. So, my, so let's not get swept up in the theatrics. What would a legal presentation be without some disclaimers? Of course, we're covering quite a lot of foreign jurisdictions here, and these, all these developments operate within a very kind of complex legal system. They all have specific nuances, and we're not foreign lawyers in each of these. So while we're trying to minimize the misinterpretation, uh, there's a lot of misre misreporting about these issues, as you would have seen within the media and what these actually are. We try to minimize these as much as possible. So we're going to start by setting the scene with uh, the foundations for really how we are raising animals, including through sentience and otherwise, as well as looking some footholds within environmental law. We're then going to look at some specific foreign developments, and, and more particularly, we're going to look at Indian theaters, South African theaters, and Argentinian theaters. And then for our final act, we're briefly going to cover some international law, so all at an international level. And we're not really going to be looking at specific things such as bans on fur and bans on animals uh, in circuses and things like that, we're actually going to look at developments that look at elevating or raising the status of animals. So those uh, developments are all very important and of course they do raise the status, but we're really going to be looking at things on a broader level. So let's get the show on the road. So as we know, the interests of animals have historically and by design been fixed outside the law's consideration with animals reduced, as I think Amy put it, to mere props on the legal stage, and not just here in the US, but in every theater around the world. 
But thanks to the efforts of advocates, these platforms are literally shifting beneath our feet. A different script is being written, with courts actually employing the, the metaphor of theater to recast animals into legal persons in these domestic and foreign productions. And so it's important, we thought, to situate these developments against a historical backdrop, to recognize how animals have, for decades now, been waiting in the wings or just off stage in this effort to transform them into essentially legal actors. To that end, uh, we'd like to observe first the evolution of their status from being merely props or property, and second, some of these significant footholds that they've gained in light of their relationship to the environment. So to uh, you know, part the curtain here, uh, we thought where better to start than by introducing one of Animal Law's all-time favorite mustachioed villains, Rene Descartes. So as many know, um, the French philosopher and mathematician declared all non-human animals to be automatons. Although they reacted to external stimuli, he said, they didn't actually feel pain or experience pleasure. They were really no different in his view from biological machines. And what this pronouncement ushered forth was this era of moral indifference, if not outright hostility toward this notion that animals should receive welfare consideration that would inform legal minds for centuries. Yet in what amounts to a rejection of Descartes' stance today, countries all around the world are enshrining into law what society largely deems apparent now, that animals are in fact sentient beings and that this makes them worthy of moral consideration. But before we dive into some of these developments, what are we actually talking about when we talk about sentience? What are we recognizing when we enshrine animal sentience into law? Strikingly, and as I think Amy will point out, our laws that recognize animal sentience don't actually establish what it is. So just a couple working definitions. So the Sentience Institute describes it simply as this capacity to feel, to perceive, and to have positive and ne negative affective states. A more involved definition from Lori Marino frames it as this multidimensional subjective phenomenon, one that contemplates these degrees of self-awareness, metacognition, a theory of the mind, and more. So it's perhaps fitting that France was one of the first, if not the first country, to turn the page on Descartes. In 1976, it paired the recognition of animal sentience with this requirement that owned animals be kept in conditions appropriate to their species. Just a few years ago, so 2015, it amended its civil code to transform their legal status from quote unquote movable property to living beings gifted with sentience. To zoom out just a bit, the EU recognized the sentience of animals in 1997 and reaffirmed it in 2009 when the TFEU, or the functioning of the European Union, was amended by the Treaty of Lisbon. And so although, CD, although sentience wasn't defined, its implication was underscored with this requirement that the EU and its member states pay, quote unquote, full regard to animal welfare requirements. So that said, and as we see in most of these codifications, there are implicit as well as explicit limits to this recognition, with exceptions carved out here as we see for religious traditions, cultural practices, heritage, and so on. And so what these exceptions reveal is that advocates shouldn't consider this, this just acknowledgement of animal sentience as a cure-all for the many injustices that animals face. Great, so shifting continents to the African Union. In 2017, the African Union, through its AU IBAR, which is essentially the Inter-Bureau for Animal Resources, uh, and it's more specifically its Animal Platform for Animal Welfare, released its Animal Welfare Strategy, and this is really going forward for the next five years. And they explicitly, in the vision as well as the mission, recognized animals as sentient beings, which of course is very exciting for at a regional level to be acknowledged, such as the EU, but also for the 55 member states that form part of the African Union. So this excitement aside, it's important to consider it in the broader context of the African continent and the AU. 250 million poor people within Africa rely on livestock for their livelihoods. This is likely the reason that the strategy also includes some, some certain exceptions, right? So animals can be used to help reduce poverty and hunger. Another one, taking care of the welfare of animals is not just a concept for the rich or the Western nations. To the contrary, animal care is deeply rooted in African societies and human practices which promote animal welfare may have a direct link to increased animal productivity. So here we're kind of seeing 
yes, it's important to take care of animals, they're sentient and they have welfare needs, but also why are we doing this? They're largely anthropocentric, right? We want to essentially ensure that we can continue to use them. We want to ensure competitive and sustainable animal resource industry. Other, other things that we see included throughout the animal welfare strategy are human well-being, sustainable livelihoods, transforming socioeconomic circumstances, poverty reduction, and economic growth. So we really need to consider that recordal of sentience, which of course is exciting and important, but in the broader context in which it operates. And moving on then to some very selected jurisdictions, and this isn't, an, uh, this isn't a complete list, but what this list, would, what we tried to do was essentially look at jurisdictions that explicitly use the word sentient or sentience. So not necessarily the notion of what it is, but actually that specific word. And what I found interesting, the first two there you see are both African countries. So in 2008, Tanzania in the Animal Welfare Act recorded that animals are sentient beings. And unlike a lot of jurisdictions, they actually defined what sentience means. And what, how they defined it was the capability of an animal to be aware of sensations, emotions, feeling, pain, suffering and enjoying their species specific needs. So that's very a, a nice definition. But also recognized within that same act is that animal welfare enhances livestock productivity. So again, we're seeing these two ideas used together. In South Africa in 2008, and this wasn't at a national level, our Animal Protection Act, this was rather at a regulatory level, specifically relating to the management of elephants within the continent, it's the norms and standards. And they basically say that elephants need to be man managed within the Republic of South Africa in such a way that recognizes their sentient nature. But also within that same document, they allow and provide for the culling of elephants. And they also, when an animal is categorized as a damage-causing animal, you're allowed to essentially shoot it, provided you have permits and, and things like that. So that's kind of the broader context. And then within our law, at a national level, you're still allowed to use animals in circuses and keep them in zoos. So despite recognition of their sentient status, they still have all these other exceptions. And then other jurisdictions across the world, I'm not gonna go through all of these. New Zealand, for example, was one of the first Commonwealth countries to explicitly record the sentience of animals, but again, we don't see that definition. So this kind of raises some important questions for us. Sorry, is, is really what are the implications for, for recording the sentience of animals? Great, moving on from sentience, we look at this non-thing status. Now there's a number of jurisdictions that have explicitly said animals are not things, or they are not objects, right? So we've got a few of them on the board there, very excitingly. And then aside from this non-thing, we see a recognition of them as living creatures and living beings. In Portugal, for example, this came very recently and within that same act they spoke about companion animals and how their custody needs to be considered in divorce matters. In Slovakia, they said that they enjoy a special legal status because they're able to perceive their surroundings around them. And Portugal's also considering similar things. So what does this all mean in practice? Well, it's great that we're, reco we're recording these things, but there's a lack of clarity. When we're not defining what sentience is and what it means, how are we attaching legal objects, legal things to that, right? What are we supposed to do to recognize this? What are our obligations to these animals? It's not very clear. And is sentience the thing that we should be relying on to distinguish it? That in often would separate us from other categories of animals. So aquatic animals, their sentience has largely been denied. Right, and that's part of the work at the Aquatic Animal Law Initiative. Shout out to Kathy. And we're seeing a lot of growing science to recognize specifically the sentience of, of fish. But again, is this the criteria that we should be using to uplift animals? Is this merely symbolic or is it revolutionary? Uh, are, we, are we accepting this then? We've, we've got sentience, that's great, that's a win. But um, is it just quietening us down now because we finally got something in our legislation? Again, all of it needs to be considered in this anthropocentric way that it's recorded. And also, what about animals that aren't sentient? Are they not deserving of our protection? Sure, thanks. So, let's see. so animals have also seen footholds for personhood and rights of nature paradigms, 
which have been heavily informed by indigenous perspectives on this harmonious relationship between humanity and the environment. A prominent example comes to us from Ecuador, the first and I believe the only country to enshrine the rights of nature at the constitutional level. And so what this framework reveals is this shift from this notion of the Earth's sort of unending abundance towards a more sort of non-destructive natural use, which implicates animal considerations and indeed, you know, animal rights uh, with respect to issues such as species loss, as we see here um, in Article 72. Also note in Article 74 that everyone is constitutionally authorized and indeed sort of uh, required to enforce these rights of nature. In a similar vein, we also have uh, Bolivia's Law of Mother Earth, which is a direct result of protests by indigenous and other groups in 2000 and 2003 over the equitable, or I guess I should say inequitable, distribution of natural resources in that country. Soon after, Bolivia's constitution was redrafted, and this concept of vivir bien, or living well, was incorporated into national law, creating this right to a healthy environment. So the Law of Mother Earth, was created as a kind of umbrella or framework law, and all state and national laws are supposed to conform to its provisions. As you can see here, chapter one of this law contemplates Mother Earth as a legal entity with enforceable rights. And chapter two defines her as a composite of interrelated life. So animals are included here, and this affords advocates, if just in theory, a platform to protect animals who have an inherent interest in life, diversity, and more. And notably, and finally, chapter four creates the ability and actually a duty, again, on the part of the state and the people to uphold and enforce these rights. Of course, just as with the recognition of animal sentience, these rights of nature paradigms are no panacea either. In fact, the law of Mother Earth is criticized for being purely symbolic, as the office of Mother Earth, which is supposed to enforce these rights, has yet to be created. Not to mention that the state itself, which is supposed to enforce the law, has been the primary violator of it. Now that said, and as we'll see, the recognition that animals make up this integral part of the environment has led to some actual, you know, very real advancements in the status of animals in some other arenas. Okay, great, we're into act two. We're gonna spotlight some gains in some foreign theaters, India, South Africa, Argentina, and then a few others. So this case um, came out of the state of Haryana earlier this year, so 2019, and it concerned the conviction of a group of men who were arrested way back in 2004 for allegedly smuggling 29 cows across state lines to be slaughtered. As some in the audience, I believe, probably know, the topic of cow slaughter is a sensitive issue in India, with cows believed to be manifestations of both the maternal and the divine. And what our defendants sort of collectively um, contend is that the state hadn't proved its case against them, specifically that there wasn't enough evidence to convict. So they appealed to the High Court of Punjab and Haryana, and over the, first, over the course of the first four pages of a 104-page decision, our judge, Rajiv Sharma, upholds their conviction based on the evidence before him. But what he argues is that the 15 years that these men have anxiously been awaiting the outcome of their case is punishment enough, and he vacates their sentences. Essentially, their time has already been served. So, if you're doing the math with me, that leaves us with 100 pages left to go. <laughs> and the judge begins this transition into what would otherwise be dismissed here in the US as dicta by saying that, quote, it would be relevant to take into consideration that 29 cows were packed in a cruel and brutal manner in these two trucks. And he proceeds to detail some of the State Animal Welfare Board's regulations for transporting animals using motor vehicles, and he observes several requirements under national laws and regulations in some of these other animal use arenas. And I won't name them all, but there are many, and they took up very many pages of the, uh, the opinion. And what follows, actually, is really important, this non sequitur, really, into the legal status of Hindu idols. And what the judge details is the spiritual framework for understanding legal personhood. And what he observes is that, the, is that property vests in this sort of ethereal deity, this entity without form or substance. And when a priest or a guru conducts this particular religious ceremony, that formless deity is united both with that wooden idol and with that priest who becomes a caretaker or a guardian. And what the judge is analogizing to here is the creation of a corporation, which likewise exists as this sort of imagined entity in the ether through and through the sort of legal ritual of submitting some articles of incorporation is bound to a physical address and to its president, to its secretary, or whoever happened to incorporate it. 
And let me just take a moment here to underscore what Judge Sharma is really doing here and why this case presents us with such a unique opportunity. He's observing that in a Hindu majority nation, we think of God as ethereal, but accept also that God is found in each and every one of these 29 cows. And so if we can consider blocks of wood, inanimate wood, to be uh, legal persons, then why not with their living and breathing counterparts? And by extension, why not all of the other animals whom the law has crafted these protections for? But who would incorporate them, one might ask? Well, he says, the very actors who make up the theater, theater of India's legal government. And here, Judge Sharma actually employs the theater, the metaphor of theater, to make his point that the state is already doing this, is assigning legal personhood roles as if they were parts in a play. And he raises this critical question of, well, who would act on behalf of these animals to enforce their rights? Well, he says, any human could act in loco parentis. Every citizen would be an animal's legal guardian. And this isn't just in theory, he says. Indians are already required to do this by law. And to make his case, he points to the National Prevention of Cruelty to Animals Act, and he observes both the positive and negative duties that humans have towards animals. But these, he notes, these are just statutory rights created by a legislative body who, like in many countries, may be co-opted by corporate interests. And so he pivots to the very foundation, the substrate of India's legal theater, specifically to Article 51 of the Constitution, which requires citizens to demonstrate an ethic of humanism and to have compassion for living creatures. And he reasons that if humans owe this duty, then animals have something more than just a statutory right to be treated humanely, to be afforded compassion. They have a foundational right and so are already legal persons vis-a-vis -vis the exact same legal framework by which all Indians are afforded this legal persona. So what does this mean? For one, we should apply animal welfare laws broadly and courts shouldn't allow them to be circumvented. And to that end, Judge Sharma returns to that long list of animal protections and he not only orders the state of Haryana to raise all of its animal welfare standards to what he sees the law as requiring, but he also demands that state actors and citizens take steps to enforce them as well. And he leaves us with this pronouncement that animals are already legal persons. And in this vein, he's not operating as just some, you know, deus ex machina, being lowered down from the rafters and sort of transforming the legal theater below. Rather, he's observing that India's legal theater already requires and is asking us to simply stick to the script that we ourselves have written. We already require that animals are legal persons. And of course, this pronouncement raises certain questions, even causes for concern. This idea that legal rights should be predicated upon legal duties as if personhood were some kind of currency, where to enjoy rights one should, to turn the coin, uh, owe legal duties to other people. And if that's true, what duties does Judge Sarma see us as requiring? Well, he doesn't quite say. Great, so moving on to the South African theater. I believe South Africa prevent, uh, presents a very exciting case study. So the case I'm gonna delve into in detail is the NSPCA versus the Minister of Justice. It was a 2016 case in our Constitutional Court. The Constitutional Court is the highest court in the land. That's important, our constitution is the supreme law of the land, so everything needs to be consistent with it and all laws and actions need to kind of be interpreted in light of it. And this was a unanimous judgment with nine, judgment, ju nine judges. So that's kind of the background. And the facts of the case involved a religious sacrificial slaughter of two camels and essentially what happened was there was an inspector on site from our National Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. It's a long thing, so I'm just gonna call them the NSPCA. And important is that they are a statutory body. They're incorporated in terms of law, and they really enforce our Animal Protection Act. So they were present at the slaughter, and there was, without being too graphic, a number of att attempts to slice the camel's throats, which were unsuccessful, and eventually, in an act of compassion, the inspector there shot the camels to put them out of their misery. Now, what really arose from that was that they wanted this case to be prosecuted, and the prosecuting authority refused to do so, 
and then they could then essentially apply for, apply for a private prosecution. You need to get an Ale Prosecui, which is a, a certificate, and then they tried to go that route, but then were further denied. So the, the case really, the central tenant of it revolved around their ability to bring private prosecutions and essentially enforce our Animal Protection Act. So that was really the background of the case. But what, what's really interesting is that the court took this opportunity to really expand on the law. So I've put up some of the statements that the court made in its judgment. And here they say the rationale between, behind protecting animals has shifted. Okay, simply from guarding the moral status of man, where we see a lot of the previous animal protection laws were based around us as humans and how it offended our greater dignities when we were cruel to animals, he's saying that's changed, that it's no longer about that. We are now placing intrinsic worth on animals as individuals. Animal welfare is connected to the constitutional right to have the environment protected. That is a fundamental human right within our constitution. And he is saying that that is interpreted to include animals. Animals are not expressly included within our constitution other than to talk about who can deal with them in terms of competencies of government. So here we're actually elevating their status by including them within our human right to environment. And not only are we including them, we're including them as individuals with their individual interests. And here the court refers to the integrative approach, and in a, in a very brief nutshell, this was a term that was coined by Professor David Bilchitz, and what it means is when we're looking at protecting and conserving species, we need to consider the individual. So it's not possible for us to consider non-endangerment and non-extinction without looking at how an individual is important and how that individual operates within the broader context. Now this is very much compared with the aggregative approach, which he, which he calls the aggregative approach, when we look at something like trophy hunting, where the argument is essentially like the funds we get from killing this one animal will be used for greater conservation efforts. And that's this aggregative approach. We're looking at the overall good for the species. And he rejects that idea and he says, no, you can only look at proper conservation when you consider the individual of an animal. And the the court accepted this. They said this integrative approach correctly links the suffering, again, of individual animals to conservation. And it illustrates the extent to which we need to show respect for animals, but how this essentially reinforces our human rights and our conservation efforts as humans. So these are some very, very positive statements. And really, in, in this judgment, the court referred back to a number of other judgments, and one of them was this Lentong Thai case from 2014, and this involved the prosecution of a known rhino kingpin. He was implicated in a number of crimes relating to rhinos poaching, transferring across borders. I won't tell you where he is now because he's back in his country, but basically they made a number of statements saying that the duty resting on us to conserve our biodiversity is owed to pressing values, right? And constitutional values dictate a more caring attitude towards animals. Now, if everything in our country needs to be viewed through this constitutional lens, and this lens requires us to be more caring towards animals, we start to see a very favorable jurisprudence created for us that we can use in our future efforts. And the next case he refers to is, the, is that of Openshaw, and this in, involved the feeding of a live buck to a tiger on TV, but uh, it was an older case and this was a minority judgment, but importantly, one of the statements they referred to was that animals are sentient beings and that the statutes recognize this. And actually the statutes didn't explicitly recognize that, so it was quite nice that he then said this was the case and then the Constitutional Court adopted that. And then, the, the most recent case that came up just a few months ago, uh, which I wanted to talk about very briefly, was in relation to lion bones, and more specifically, we are, as South Africa, is the biggest exporter of lion bones. We extensively breed lions in captivity, and in terms of CITES, we're actually allowed to legally export a certain amount. And the, the 2017 and 2018 quotas were challenged, by the NSPCA again, and uh, they won the case, and the court said that the, the quotas were unconstitutional and invalid, but what's important and relevant here is that they refer back to the 2016 case, and it's not only talking about animals in the wild, they're actually talking about the right to environment for animals that are held in captivity as well. So this kind of makes, hones it in, it's not just animals in the wild that we need to care about for conservation purposes, we need to and should when we are intensively breeding them and domesticating them, consider their welfare and consider that as applying to them as well. 
So the main takeaways that I wanted to touch on was really the elevation of animals to a constitutional concern, not only that, through the interpretation of our human rights. And that is something that I find very exciting. When, like I said, the Constitution is supreme and we have such a big emphasis on human rights. And it might appear to some to be anthropocentric to do it this way, but if we can elevate animals to a constitutional concern and actively interpret not only the right to environment, but potentially other rights within our Constitution to include animals, that is, that is huge and that's very exciting. But the protection of animals is not just about humans, right? It's about them. It's about them as individuals themselves. They have intrinsic value. This is, an, this is a statement by the court. And they don't just have instrumental value. They're not just here for us to use and make money of. They're not economic tools. Okay, they are important as individuals. I mentioned that. Not just, and a, a lot of our, our legislation looks at them for conservation and biodiversity purposes. So that kind of thwarts that. Is human rights are, are implicated by animal interests. This is great, and it's not just ones that are in the wild, it's ones that are, are actively being domesticated. Now, animal conservation, animal protection, sorry, animal welfare and animal conservation are intertwined, and this opens the door. Great. Okay, so this case, uh, 2016 case, comes from Argentina, and it concerns a habeas corpus action to free a captive orangutan named a Cecilia from some rather deplorable conditions at the Mendoza Zoo. Uh, the petition was brought by an animal rights organization called AFADA, and they essentially assert that Cecilia is a non-human person, someone who is innocent of any crime and has yet to be convicted, uh, yet has been convicted by a public official and confined without due process. And in their habeas petition, they make two specific um, arguments. First, that Cecilia is again being arbitrarily and illegally detained. And second, that the conditions of that confinement, and this is the important one, pose a risk to her physical health and emotional well-being. And it's important to note that Afada is immediately dismissed as an inappropriate party to the case based on some procedural grounds. So what does that mean? Well, even though this habeas corpus action is brought in Cecilia's name now, there's no third party who's able to actively advocate for her interests. And given that Cecilia literally cannot speak for herself before the court, uh, one would think that this case would have been dismissed. Except that the court observes that it has the power of Uranovit Curia, the civil law construct that's part and parcel of the inquisitorial system. And as applied to the present case, the court observes that despite this defect in Afada's standing, it knows the law and can apply the law itself. And the court begins its personhood analysis in a curious place, and that's by observing that in the theater of Argentina, human actors are afforded a certain set of rights, and I'm gonna go through these here. First, we have Article 43, and this is a constitutional right of collective impact. Basically, Argentinians share the single stage and have a collective interest in all of those things that affect them collectively. And then we have Article 41, which affords them this healthy use of the environment. And this includes things like the natural patrimony, cultural values. And on the one hand, these things sort of stand apart, but they're also housed in this right or this guarantee to a quality of social life. And then we have this national law that basically affirms that fauna are a public interest. And because they're a public interest, everybody has this duty to protect them. And finally, we have Article 16, which gives the court these broad powers to intervene when they're trying to protect our collective interests. And so just as there are rights for our human actors, there are necessarily objects of those rights. And I've tried to parallel them here as best as I can. So with this collective right to the environment, as it pertains to a quality of social life, we get to enjoy things like parks and even landscapes. Um, we also have a protected aesthetic interest in enjoying cultural resources like traditional sculptures. This idea being that once we invest in something as a people and consider that thing part of our culture, it should also be protected because it affects us collectively. And the court notes this sort of previous case holding that this collective impact applies to dolphins given that we enjoy them as part of our natural and cultural heritage. So, how does Cecilia fit into this legal theater, given its human actors and sometimes animal objects? Well, as an orangutan, Cecilia is clearly part of the animal kingdom. She's part of the natural and cultural patrimony of the state, and humans have this right to enjoy her as an object. 
But Cecilia is also so similar to our human subjects, the actors of our play. She has these cognitive capacities of a young human. She's emotionally complex and psychologically complex. Genetically, the court observes, she shares 99.4% of our DNA. And in this moment, the court actually frames her as a sort of honorary member of human society. As such, she's recognized as both a subject and an object. She's part of the natural world and part of the human world as well. And so wheels this kind of, I call it a dual identity. She operates in both spheres. And I want to be careful about how I frame this, um, but what the court is saying is that, yes, Cecilia is an object, but an object with so many of the characteristics of a subject that as an honorary subject, she too should, get to enjo she too should get to enjoy this quality of social life, which includes these natural and cultural, cultural objects of which she is one. Put another way, Cecilia is a prop, but she's also an actor, which means that she, like us, has the right to enjoy herself as a prop that affects us collectively. So ultimately, the court determines that the detention itself isn't arbitrary or illegal. After all, the Mendoza Zoo was authorized to house animals some 200 years ago. But there's this fundamental right to a natural environment, which is part of this quality of social life. And because the zoo can't afford this or can't provide this, the conditions of the confinement and not the confinement itself those are what violate Cecilia's newly recognized habeas corpus guarantee. And I won't remark as to whether the court's logic goes too far or perhaps not even far enough, but I want to underscore the conclusion that this case is somewhat bittersweet. The, the state can't give Cecilia what she needs to thrive, and so the only option is to move her to a sanctuary in another country, to another political and legal theater altogether, one in which she technically won't be a legal subject or a legal person any longer. And the court seems to recognize sort of the tragedy that's being played out, and the judge characterizes Cecilia as this kind of antithesis of the biblical scapegoat, this animal the community would symbolically sort of lay their sins upon before casting him out in the wild, with this ritual supposed to bring the community together. But in contrast, our judge calls upon citizens, the human actors of Argentina, to put their kindness, their warmth, their good feelings into Cecilia before sending her off to ensure her well-being which comes at the loss of our heritage and her heritage, not to mention this newly recognized member of our community. But the tragedy, of course, is this couldn't play out any other way. And I wanted to offer up this quote, which I won't read, but I've included to point out just that the court is also drawing comparisons to theater and its legal artifice in order to illustrate how animals are already actors, albeit involuntary ones, on these stages. And that as the directors of these theaters, it's incumbent upon the state to provide for their interests as well. Of course, this case also presents certain causes for concern or confusion, such as if Cecilia is being recognized as a legal person due to her proximity to humankind, well, what's the cutoff line? Uh, the court observes a particular DNA percentage, observes some cognitive capacities, but does that cling problematically to this sort of form of anthropocentrism? And then also, what are our obligations to these exiled persons once they've left our national theaters? Is it appropriate in all or any cases to basically ship them off, or do we owe them a duty, as we would to a human actor, to take care of them in our own sort of legal theaters? Um, there are another of an, a number of other sort of personhood cases that we just don't have time to go into, but some other folks who spoke previously have um, mentioned them, but um, they're just listed here, and if you have any questions about them at the end, we'll be happy to, to chat about them. Thanks. So moving on to our third and final act, we're going to be speaking about some international productions, really animals and how they dealt with at an international level, and then maybe some potential future developments that are being utilized. So international animal law is a very big subject, so I'm just going to try and focus on a few things here. Basically, at an international level, there's no specific treaty dealing with either the sentience of animals or their welfare specifically. The way that we see them being dealt with really is largely as commodities, so we're looking at their trade across borders, we're looking at how they implicate human health and, and humans, and more specifically, conservation, biodiversity issues, stopping them from going extinct and endangered, those sorts of things are really the things that we are concerned about. I'm going to talk briefly about the Convention on Biological Diversity. It's uh, one of the very highly ratified treaties. 
as the name suggests, it talks about biological diversity. What I found interesting is that in the preamble, they specifically look at uh, the intrinsic value of biodiversity, and then really the remainder of the treaty is, is how we can ex 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 essentially use it to and exploit it, uh, and more specifically how states can do so as, as long as it doesn't you know, hit certain boundaries. So on one hand, we're acknowledging the intrinsic value, and then in the other, we're really saying, well, how much does it actually mean? The second one is the World Animal Health Organization, and they are actually, this is actually uh, an organization that has made a lot of efforts to at least touch on the issues of welfare, maybe more so than others. Uh, they don't specifically set standards that are very clear, and th there's a lot of criticism about them dealing with this welfare. Essentially, their focus is on animal health, and, and even more specifically, it's really to help us as humans, so that's kind of the background of that, but again, they are, they, we are seeing some efforts, and in their 2017 strategy, they also acknowledge the sentience of animals, but again, in this anthropocentric context. CITES is a fun one. Um, <laughs> the Convention on International Trade, the, the emphasis on trade there, we really are looking at animals as commodities, and although we're looking at ensuring that they don't go extinct, that is the focus of CITES. It is a highly debated topic. This year at COP18 uh, was not any different. There was a lot of contentious issues. There was a lot of threats by different countries. There's a huge African divide within the continent of Africa as to how to deal with wildlife. Uh, I'm ashamed to say how some of the SADC countries want to deal with it, but essentially it regulates certain species. They, they indicate that they look at the protection of over 35,000 species, but again, what are we looking at in terms of protection? One of the topics that came up very hotly contested was that of elephants, and more specifically, uh, how CITES works is, is a transfer across borders and the issuing of certain permits, and more specifically, elephants to appropriate and acceptable destinations. So really, they were kind of honing in on what the definition of appropriate and acceptable was for elephants, and more specifically, wild-caught elephants. And there was proposals put forward for resolutions, essentially trying to stop them from being taken to ex situ conservation, so things like zoos and that. There was a lot of debate back and forth, EU, I'm not gonna get into the details, but essentially what was hailed as a big success for them was that we can't take elephants out of the wild and put them into this in uh, ex situ circumstances, only in exceptional circumstances can we do this and subject to other disclaimers. So at least it's a step forward for wild elephants. Um, but again, we're, we've yet to see, um, uh, well, it hasn't come into force yet, but we've yet to see a marked improvement for those elephants. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how that's enforced. We, we know just this week that 33 elephants were taken from them. So, moving on to World Trade. Sure. So the GATT, or the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, was entered shortly into after, short, entered shortly into after uh, World War II. And its core purpose was to reduce or remove barriers to trade, on the one hand, just to increase trade and uh, spur the economy among countries, but also with the hopes of eliminating protectionism and trade wars, which lead or can lead, as we know, to actual military conflicts. So the GATT is a set of rules and has been updated several times. And in 1995, it evolved into the World Trade Organization. And in the early 2000s, the EU, citing some public attitudes towards the killing of seals, created what it called the EU seal regime, which prohibited the import of seal products, but allowed for certain exceptions, which you can see here, a traveler's exception, resource management exception, and for community hunts, which was, I think, the most controversial of the three. Um, we also have then Canada and Norway, and they're arguing that this EU framework violates the provisions of the GATT, specifically that it discriminates against them by giving an advantage to Greenland's indigenous communities and keeping out their own commercial hunts. In its defense, we have the EU pointing to specific sections or specific exceptions in the GATT, specifically this exception that protects for public morals. In this case, um, the EU is arguing that the EU seal regime protects um, uh, animal welfare, and that's an issue of public moral concern, and therefore falls under an exception to some of the GATT rules. Um, what's important to take away for this case is that um, for advocates is that the WTO basically confirmed that animal welfare is a legitimate object of moral concern to the point that on the international stage, 
we're willing to sacrifice the benefits of free trade and economic stability to protect animals, this despite their histor historical commodification as chattel property. And I should note that, this, that the WTO actually ended up ruling against the EU and their, their seal regime because the exception that was carved out to borrow a US phrase was um, not, not narrowly tailored enough to keep out other seal products from Inuit hunts, which were arguably just as uh, problematic uh, morally to e EU citizens and consumers. But again, this case confirms this sort of global shift in thinking about animal status and that they matter to us morally. So moving on to some potential platforms that have been used or have been mentioned at least in the past. And again, there's a number of different efforts and uh, we're really just looking at a few more specifically. There hasn't been any of these that have been accepted. I'm gonna put them all up there. The first two are declarations. So declarations do not have the same international law status as a treaty, but nevertheless are important because they're essentially a stand in a way of countries saying that this is an important issue. Uh, the, the one that's gained a lot of traction is the Universal Declaration on Animal Welfare, and it's gone through many iterations, most recently in 2011. And again, it's been signed on by a few. It's, it's gotten some traction. It explicitly records that animals animals are sentient beings. Again, though, it, it largely has an anthropocentric focus as to why we need to take care of animals. It's largely for our own health. It's largely because it affects our productivity and our economic interests and things like that. Uh, one which is also a declaration but is completely different really to the, the UDOR is the UDAR and there's, a, there's another one with a similar name but this is the one that was uh, done in 1978 in France at a, and declared in UNESCO session and it's really one of the most ambitious international things that I've seen for animals and it's quite exciting to look back at this 40 years ago to see what they've we're declaring and actually seeing that some of these things are in fact in our laws around the world in one way or another. One of them is talking about representation in government. Obviously the other more ambitious ones are everyone has a right, to, every animal has a right to life, which obviously is, is hotly contested. But I think it's exciting to at least see what they wanted back then and what they saw as, as, as good and positive for animals is in fact happening. And it went through an iteration into 1989, but again, there's been no other movement on it since then. And the last one is the International Convention. And this is in fact a treaty, it's not a declaration, it was drafted by David Faber. And again, it's got largely anthropocentric concerns, but it is trying to set some sort of explicit standards for animals and their welfare. And it does, and it's very detailed in terms of what it's requesting, but again, it's a welfare thing. But all of these efforts, I think, it's important to note that they're rejecting the status quo, they're rejecting how animals are, are treated at an international level, they're looking to improve them, and, and whether or not they've actually been signed on, it's, it's important that these efforts are in fact happening. Other things that are happening, include the interpretation of existing international law to try and use these as, as ways to improve conditions for animals. I know Charlotte Blatton has just written a book about this, so that's very exciting. And what's also exciting is we're seeing in the environmental law at an international level, a lot of scholarship and a lot of efforts to actually incorporate animal welfare into the, con into the consideration of species extinction and endangerment. So this is kind of that integrative approach that I spoke about that we saw in the South African law there's a whole book now, also just recently edited by a South African uh, academic about welfare, the welfare of animals in international law. And I think this is exciting because who knows where it's going to go, but, but it's happening. So some final thoughts for our final curtain of our show. We've seen a general upward, uh, upward trend for animals within our legal system, and this, is in, this has been done in many different ways. It's through this, the recordals of sentience, through their non-thing status, and even through the interpretation of existing human rights. Okay, um, there have, of course, been some regressive steps, and also important to note is that we kind of touched on the legislative and the judicial efforts, but of course we need to look at the executive, really, and, and some of their efforts, which, and, and are these generally positive or negative? Uh, I won't make any further comments on that. Uh, in terms of international law, there's, again, some very exciting possibilities out there, and the more we continue to build scholarship and academia on these issues, I think the more traction it will receive. 
What are the actual implications for animals? Well, we've already seen it. It's positive. Um, we need to kind of consider that when, we, when we're pushing for legislative efforts to try and create a bit more certainty for what our obligations then are towards animals and how they're going to operate in the broader context of the acts, the acts they're recorded in, our legal systems, our societies, and then, of course, more broadly, how they impact in our country-level uh, uh, relationships. There are, of course, a number of challenges, which we're all aware of. Uh, what is exciting is that we see animal advocates around the world working with these and working within their own legal systems. And uh, there's a number of opportunities created. And as we know, what we're trying to do for animals is um, a revolutionary act. So I think what we want to leave with is that keep going at it, because the show must go on. That's fine. So what we can do right now is open it up for questions and answers. You can come up to either side. Why don't we start with you, Priscilla? Thank you both, Raj and Amy. My question is, um, from everything that we're seeing on the international efforts for animal protection and the promising, promising uh, opinions that are coming out, would do you, both of you have advice for United States-based attorneys of what we can learn from these international um, efforts to protect animals. Thank you. Well, I think one of the things that we're seeing, and particularly with that um, Judge, Sharma or Judge Sharma opinion, that 104-page uh, um, uh, holding, or the 104-page case, is that he's really taking a lot of time to sort of draw from a lot of other jurisdictions and put these things into conversation. And um, I really did mean it when I, when I said that he doesn't see himself as some sort of deus, deus ex machina, um, try to, to try to, you know, uh, how should I put it, uh, radically transform sort of the legal theater and our understanding of the legal theater. And he's putting it into terms um, that I think can appeal to US judges here. We already sort of owe these duties, you know, societally to animals, and so it's not necessarily such a drastic sort of change in thinking that we need to adopt in order to um, consider animals to be legal persons, to be sort of the beneficiaries of these, um, of these laws. It's already happening, and we're already sort of writing that into our scripts. It's just we're not calling it that, and if we just allow ourselves to have that sort of shift in thought to allow us to use these terms that have, you know, scared us for so long, um, we're not going to see sort of the floodgates opening. That's not something that we that we really need to like worry about. And um, that's why, again why I appreciated uh, Judge Sharma's or opinion um, with respect to the Argentinian case too. Um, you know, it is problematically for me anthropocentric, but maybe that is just the way that we have to sort of operate in order to make those first, you know, effective steps to um, open that circle of compassion and open sort of the, the possibility for for animal personhood by sort of limiting it, limiting it to certain, you know, um, to certain animals who look like us or um, have some of our sort of uh, qualities. Thanks. Yeah, I think, uh, I think it's just important to acknowledge that there is stuff happening in other jurisdictions and maybe, you know, I, I, I respect the fact that animal law in, in the USA is an extremely well-developed field that has been going for so long, but I think there's still definitely things that you can learn. And just by being open and, and kind of looking at these other jurisdictions, looking at the cases, seeing how advocates are doing it in other countries, working within their own legal systems, is just an important thing to do at all, I think, maybe. Do I have to go ahead and ask a question? Um, I did my graduate research for uh, my degree in linguistic anthropology in Central America, and um, I worked with endangered languages. Um, I, I listened to a, a conversation on the radio once. Um, a couple of people were talking about some fish that got um, tr trapped by a flood or something, and they noticed that the children were worried about those fish and, and figuring out how to get them back into the stream because they were trapped. And these women were saying, isn't it amazing that the young people noticed that these fish were trapped? The adults didn't, um, they didn't respond to that. And I think what's salient about that to me is that um, 
it's important to think generationally in terms of changing attitudes. And I think it's really important for um, you know, so-called developed countries to try to export um, a sense of the intrinsic value of animals because the laws that we're all here talking about today, they have to start somewhere and um, you know, they ha there has to be um, a groundswell of, of public support. Um, so um, I think that, um, that we have a, a role to, um, try to try to influence future generations wherever we live and to try to export um, more of a sense of um, kindness towards animals in our, um, you know, in our uh, inter interactions ac across the world. So that's all I wanted to say. Do you want to speak to me? Thank yeah. you. Uh, I think I think that's great. I think something that I've kind of observed is that. Again, the West looks at developing countries and they think we're very backwards and things. And I think, um, actually, if we look back at the relationship that people traditionally had with animals and traditionally had with the earth, we start to see a very different way. And, and the current situation that we're looking at is because of the, these Western ideas that have been imported and colonialism and things like that. And as soon as we start rejecting those ideas and kind of going back to the rela relationships that we had with the earth and the animals, like we're seeing in these acts of nature and Mother Earth and really respecting that, I think we'll have a much better way of improving the condition for everyone, so. Hi. Um, so I'm wondering, large voting influential international bodies like the IUCN are open to NGO membership. And I'm kind of curious as to whether you have any thoughts on why there isn't a stronger push on the part of welfare NGOs and organizations to participate. Because I've noticed particularly um, the Species Survival Commission and a lot of these conservation groups are largely funded and there's a lot of participation from exhibitors like SeaWorld and these other entities that are at odds with, you know, this movement and, and our objectives in improving, you know, the lives of animals. And I'm sort of wondering what you think, if you think there's a future for greater participation for welfare organizations to sort of shape international law through greater participation. So I think that's a great observation and I think there is definitely an interest in wanting to be involved in both the IUCN and other international treaties like CITES. I see it with organizations that we're involved in in South Africa, they really want to be involved. It's mainly lack of resources that they have, both financial and uh, otherwise. And I think slowly but surely they are gaining traction. You know, they're getting scientists involved, they're getting lawyers involved, they get, they're gathering these resources so that they can have kind of a fair fight with these with these sea worlds and with all these other organizations that essentially uh, use animals. And I think, uh, I think it's changing. I think we, we have a lot of think tanks. We're collate, falling, uh, sorry, forming coalitions and we're working together a lot better to try and gather those scientific and otherwise resources. So it's happening. I just think it might take a while in, to see. We have time for one more quick question. Hi, Amy and Raj. <laughs> Hi. Uh -oh. My name is Lorna, and uh, for the people that don't know me, I'm from Bolivia. Uh, and I think it would be very ir irresponsible for me like, not to take the opportunity to talk since Raj, you mentioned Mother Law, Mother Earth Law here, the case of Bolivia. I appreciate you clarified that the department in charge of protecting it hasn't been created and it's more than 12 years. So this law is just serving as lip service. But I want you to take one more thing into account, and it's even like uh, worse than not being implemented. I think sometimes laws in favor of animals and constitutions, specifically in the Latin American context, which is my context, has been used, uh, animals as, are being used as instruments even more for a political agenda. So we have all these left wing governments, indigenous governments, that are using the passing of these laws, saying that they care about animals, just to show the international context that they are indigenous and respectful of Mother Earth. When in reality, if you pass a law that cannot be enforced, it doesn't serve any purpose. And on the contrary, it can be detrimental because this law, for example, served my dictator president 
at this point to justify his uh, respect of Mother Earth, and he received a number of prizes internationally, especially in Europe. Universities have granted him honoris causa titles. And a few weeks ago, 200 million animals died in my country in the fires in the Amazon. And nobody is talking about that. So these laws can not only be like not enforced, but can, but can be detrimental if you use them like as a political maneuver to project an image that is not the real one to the world. I just want everyone to take that into account. Sure, and um, thank you, Lorna, for bringing that up. Um, the same thing is happening in a number of countries, not just here um, in the US and in Bolivia, but you know, also in India. You see a lot of cow protection laws that are giving um, cover to a lot of politicians who get to sort of uh, make their case for why they should be reelected, but they're really being used um, to essentially allow um, the commodification and exploitation of these cows in some of these other contexts, so you know, dairy milk and so on. And so, yeah, I mean, absolutely, uh, we have to be critical of these particular laws and, you know, approach them critically and see what work they're really doing. But, you know, with respect to, you know, the, the law of Mother Earth, uh, Lorna was in my, my class last year, was a number of international students, and one of the questions that we posed at the end of the class was, well, would you rather have this law or not have this law to work from 5, 10, or 15 years from now? And it's another sort of question that we have to ask ourselves. We don't appreciate you know, some of these laws and what they're shielding now, but do they offer us some sort of footholds for the future? And it's just a, another sort of context in which to approach um, some of these questions. Great. Well, thank you very much, Raj and Amy. And we are done with this panel. I believe we're having a break right now. Is that right? OK. Thank you so much.